Hey, good morning, everyone. Grab a seat. We'll continue this morning worshiping the resurrected Jesus Christ. Let me say that one more time. We're going to continue to worship the resurrected Jesus Christ. We got some of us here to do that. That's cool. Hey, my name's Darren. Some of us are here for that reason. The rest of you don't know that yet. Let me explain that real quick. I don't know if you heard the songs because a lot of us weren't here, and I'll talk about that later, but it's interesting. We're here to worship Jesus, and we are not, we are not a social club. It may seem like that. Uh, this is not an event. Uh, this is a church, and church is the gathering of people that confess Jesus as the risen Lord. <clears throat> And because of that, that's different than everything else. Now, I will say, um, I'm not as late as I am to church, right? Because that's fundamentally what we think. I'm going to church. But you can't go to a gang, can you? Can you go to a gang? Can I, hey, I'm going to show up. I'll see you later at gang tonight. No, you are a gang. Am I right? Some of you are like, what are you talking about? The church is more like a gang than a movie. Anyone catching on? When I go to CrossFit late, I have to do burpees. Anyone know what a burpee is? You don't want to know. I'm not going to do it. <laughs> It'd be bad form and my coach would be upset. Um, when I go to an airplane with my kid, when I'm, when I'm, when I'm going to get on an airplane to go somewhere, um, and it's 5 o'clock, we have to leave 5 o'clock to get there an hour before so that we can get on the plane. Do you know what I have to do to prepare to show up to the airport on time with a 17-month-old who sleeps in until about 6.30? I have to do a lot of preparation. Well, that's like church. When we come as the people of God, we come to bring sacrifice, offering, worship. That's what it's called. It's not something that we spectate. It's something that we participate in. And if you got here at 945, you missed out. I'm just saying. Just saying. It's 953. It, was so, it went somewhere today. And I can't explain it. You had to experience it for yourself. That's enough of the pastoral side. I'll be preaching in just a second. But for the rest of you, welcome. <laughs> Let me shift. Uh, a couple of announcements. We're going to continue to worship. We'll pray after the service. There are communion elements. We took communion together. We worship through giving. We worship through teaching and all of those things. Um, but as far as announcements, let me just get through these things so we can jump into our teaching. These are really exciting things that we want everyone to know about. Especially if you're a woman, we have a women's retreat coming up May 29th and 31st uh, over the weekend. Um, you can sign up online. Also, there are, there are um, there's sign-ups in the back today. And here's the thing. I know some of you are thinking, I would love to do this but I can't afford it guess what we have some scholarships and if you're thinking I'm not going to go to the women's retreat because I can't afford it that is not an excuse um, we would love to help you go on this retreat it has been an amazing event every year and please 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 don't let finances get in the way women's retreat May 29th sign up in the back or go online next announcement this is really exciting this year we aren't doing empowered like we normally do we're going to do that probably um, in the fall but this uh, on May 15th you can't really see this but on May 15th we're having a night of prayer right here. It's a Friday night at 7 um, with our dear friends John Peters and Chris Jones. You guys know our British friends that are from the UK that come out here every year. Um, well, they're going to be here on, on, on that, that night, on Friday night and Sunday. They'll be leading our gatherings. And John Peters is a mentor and a dear friend of mine. But I want to call everyone, as many people as possible, to come to Franklin 7 o'clock, May 15th, for a night of prayer and worship. We're going to train um, as everyone, our congregation, in the ministry of prayer. Does that sound great? All right, so put it in your calendar. Remember May 15th, okay? Also, though, this is even more exciting, in my opinion, is uh, we're going to help plant a church in Culver City. How amazing is that? Wow, okay. I'm just hoping this 11 o'clock brothers and sisters will be just as excited as I am. Um, <laughs> For some reason, this section is always the loudest at both services. So, come on, let's get it. So, here's the deal. We're having a L.A. church plant vision night. Um, and it's going to be most likely West Side L.A., most likely Culver City. Um, and, and our friends from the U.K., Ed and Hannah Flint, who preached here a few months ago, they'll be here that weekend as well. And they're hosting this vision night. And I want the entire Garden Church to show up, if possible. Uh, we need to plant lots of churches. Do you know church planting is the most effective way to evangelize new people and to renew cities? We need lots of churches. We don't need, just need one big giant church. We need to help plant thousands of churches in our history as the garden. That's the vision and dream for the next 50 plus years. Do you have a vision for 50 years? I do. 
I want to see lots of churches planted. In Long Beach next door, in Seal Beach, even in Orange County. Yes, that's true. They need Jesus too. Just kidding if you're here. We know you love Jesus. And L.A. So uh, May, it's, it's uh, May 16th. It's a Saturday at 4 o'clock in L.A. More info on, on the website. That's it for our announcements. Now with that, let me pray. And we'll just invite the Holy Spirit to minister through the word um, as we go into our teaching. Just invite you to close your eyes. Um, Take whatever's on your laps and put it on the ground or next to you, on the person next to you. Let's just invite the Holy Spirit to, to minister this morning to us. Just wait and be quiet and take a deep breath. Come Holy Spirit, would you minister to this beautiful bride? Would you love on your children? Would you grace us with your presence and power this morning through your word? May we be um, open, attentive to what you're speaking to us uniquely in our hearts and in our minds. May you whisper to our souls. May you refresh us. God, may you uh, take away the lies we've lived with and place them with, replace them with truth. Lord, would you uh, give us insight into what you're speaking to a community in this city in the cities we come from, and to a people that you love dearly. I pray for my brothers and sisters here that are um, hungry and need to be fed, that are thirsty, that are um, longing for connection with you, longing for an experience, longing for a reminder of what they once experienced. For those that are desperate to have their marriages fixed, Lord, would you come in and bring healing to marriages today? Would you come and touch the emotional pain that we carry with like baggage and luggage, Lord? Would you come and just set us free this morning just through your word? And so we give you this time, God. We bless you. Thank you. Amen. Ephesians chapter two. Verse one, scroll there in your phones or open your Bible to chapter one, uh, two, verse one, and let's read this together. Paul writes to the church in Ephesus, as for you, you were dead in your transgressions and sins in which you used to live when you followed the ways of this world and of the ruler of the kingdom of the air, the spirit who is now at work in those who are disobedient. All of us also lived among them at one time, gratifying and the cravings of our flesh and following its desires and thoughts. Like the rest, we were by nature deserving wrath. But because of his great love for us, God, who is rich in mercy, made us alive with Christ even when we were dead in transgressions. It is by grace you have been saved. And God raised us up. Yes, who is right. It, and God raised us up with Christ and seated us with him in the heavenly realms in Christ Jesus in order that in the coming ages he might show the incom incomparable riches of his grace expressed in his kindness to us in Christ Jesus. For it is by grace, in case you forgot, you have been saved through faith, and this is not from yourselves. It is the gift of God, not by works so that no one can boast, for we are God's handiwork, created in Christ Jesus to do good works, which God prepared in advance for us to do. So we, we begin in Ephesians. We're in a series called Yes, You, and we are looking at ways of discovering our purpose and the beauty of who we are in Christ. And we recognize that there are a lot of voices in our lives, the voices in our heads speaking to the things really about us that we aren't. Last week I talked about um, the, the concepts that we, the list that we make in our heads. And I said, who you aren't isn't interesting. And we spend a lifetime w dealing with the things that we aren't in this world. The ways we compare ourselves to other people, to the mistakes we have, the failures that we lived in. And we looked at all the mistakes and failures that we have and we just recognized that that's not interesting. But what is interesting is what God speaks about us, what he says about us. We recognize that the most important thing we can recognize, the most important thing we can do is simply receive our identity from God. That what God says about you is the most important thing about you. 
And from that place, we receive our identity. We said last week that we are saints. You are all saints. In Christ, you are saints. The word is uh, holy people, per, uh, power clean from the inside out. God, when we come to Jesus, uh, transforms our old selves and gives us a new self, and we are called saints. We, can't, we don't have biblical justification, um, according to the scriptures, to call ourselves sinners if we are in Christ. That was who we were apart from Jesus. But in Christ, we are saints. And so we looked at that word and we, we processed that identity last week. And if you missed it, it's important that you catch up because um, the next four teachings kind of go together. Um, I guess there's three more after this one, or two more after this one, excuse me. And what we recognize too is that we have to be rooted in our identity because the first temptation that Jesus received or uh, uh, was confronted with was the temptation to prove his identity. If you are the son of God, do this. If you are, and the chapter before, the experience before was him being baptized and the heavenly father speaking from the heavens, you are my son. And so whenever we're confronted with our, uh, wrestling with our identity, we have to simply recognize um, that unless we, we come and operate in this world from a rooted and established identity, we will, we will tempt and be tempted to uh, prove ourselves, prove that we, who we are by what we do, who we know, and what we've accomplished. Are you with me? So Ephesians chapter two, these few verses are really a a section of declaration of what happens when you give your life to Jesus. And I wanna focus on the last verse, um, but I just wanna summarize this point because the point Paul is making is simply this. When he uses the image of being dead, he means that we are trapped, we are disabled, and we are encapsulated because of the sin in our hearts, in our lives, and the sin in our world. When he says you're dead, he's saying you are trapped by your sin. We have become enslaved to sin. And anyone that's ever dealt with serious addiction in their lives, they know what it's like to do the thing they don't want to do over and over again, even when they see the damage that it causes their family, their friends, and themselves. This is what Paul diagnoses the world as apart from Jesus. That because of our sin, we were separated from God and we were living out of this imperfection. And if you're thinking sin, that's a very Christian word, and a very you know, religious word. It is a very religious word, but it's a very human word. We were designed for perfection. And if we're living outside of that, we are living in this place of sin. We're missing the mark is another way to say it. So Paul kind of diagnoses the human condition. He says, look, apart from Christ, you are dead But then he describes what God has done. He says, but our God, who is rich in mercy, his character, his very nature, causes him, uh, forces him to act out of who he actually is. And that character, by grace, made us alive in Christ. It's the gospel. Grace is central to understanding identity. I just want you to know that. Grace, uh, in this passage, we have to understand what grace means because we, we, we've been brought into right relationship with God because of what he's done. And grace is God acting in our life to accomplish what we could not do on our own strength. Grace, let me say this again, is God acting in our life to accomplish what we, could not, what we cannot do on our own. This is what grace is, that God acts on our behalf to bring us into right relationship. And we have to understand that grace is about a gift. If God gives us this gift, we can't have a relationship because we earned it. We don't get a relationship because we, were, we, we did something for it. But what, what Paul is saying is that this relationship with God that we have is a grace from God. Not by doing anything, not by karma not by spiritual checklist or ladder that you have to climb. You don't have to go door to door and prove to the God in the sky that you're worthy of salvation. You don't, have to, you don't have a quota to meet. You don't have to prove anything. Salvation is a gift that is freely given to us. Do you know that this is good news? There are so many religions out there that do not preach this message. There are cults in the Christian world that preach something similar, but they they make you earn it and prove it. But the Christian message is, is fundamentally this. You can't do anything to earn, impress, deserve, or prove how worthy you are to God. You already are. So when we come to gather and worship, all we need to know is that. We don't have to bring God fix my marriage. God, give me a job. God, would you just help me find a mate, a spouse? We don't have to do that. We just come with this fact that I don't deserve it and you're worthy of everything. That's worship. That's a different subject. We'll start after the series. 
<laughs> we aren't saved working our way to God. We receive what has already done. And last week we talked about this. What's fundamental to our identity is knowing this, that we are becoming who we already are. We are becoming who we already are. This is what Paul talks about in Ephesians, that um, you are saint, so act like it. Become it. I, I used the illustration last week that when I was 22, um, I was pronounced husband. And did I have any idea up until that point how to be a husband? And the answer is no, of course not. Even with all the premarital, even with all the books that I read and, and all the, the, you know, the relationship that was, I had with Alex three years prior, I had 22 years of being a single person that taught me how not to be a husband. And so when I'm pronounced husband, I am a husband. I don't try to do acts of kindness and love my wife and serve her and talk to her and learn how to listen and all those things that I had to learn in the last eight years that I'm still learning. Uh, I didn't have to do those things to be a husband. I was a husband and I had to figure out how to be it. And that's what I've been doing ever since. I'm still figuring it out eight years in. Yeah, I think we're all, yeah. If anyone figures it out, let me know. But that's the same with our identity in Christ, that he sees us as perfect and holy and blameless. And so now we have to figure out how to be that. Are you with me? So, um, go to chapter 2, verse 10. Check this out. I want to focus on one word, and it's this word. Not, uh, not by works so that uh, no one can boast. It says this, verse 10. For we are God's handiwork. Circle handiwork. So this is a part one sermon. Part two will happen in two weeks. Next week, Bill's going to talk about being a temple. But I'll finish this sermon with a part two. So I'll leave you hanging. We'll look at the second part, uh, which is created in Christ Jesus to do good works. But I want to talk about handiwork. Now, before we define it, let's go to Genesis chapter one. Genesis chapter one. I don't hear any Bibles turning. Thank you. Be a, just a little louder for me. Just let me know. Put your phone on, on sound so I know it's like... Doo -doo 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 -doo. <laughs> chapter 1 verse 1 Genesis the beginning of the Bible so um, I want to I want to point out this word handiwork but but it's connected to this Hebrew word found in Genesis 1 the very first verse of our Bible it says this in the beginning God created the heavens and the earth so there is this word bara in Hebrew bara say bara Bara. A couple words we're going to learn today. Um, it's totally fine to learn some new stuff, so I'm excited to sh share this with you. But the word bara means created. But the concept in Hebrew is that the word is only used to describe something that's created by God. It's never used to describe what humans can create, but bara is what God creates. And the beyond created, the definition is really like this, this sense, this nuance of explosive, majestic, raw power creation. Right? So it's the initiation of something new. There's another Hebrew word for something that's being fashioned after it's been created. This is like raw, majestic. It's the beginning of carving off a, a piece of stone that you're going to sculpt. You, are you with me? It's like just like think of raw, majestic power. This explosive energy that, um, that speaks the world and all of the cosmos into creation, into existence. Bra, bra. Say it with me. Bra. You know you want to. Bra. <laughs> Go to Genesis 1, verse 26. So we see it, that it, it's the energy, it's the, the word that creates the cosmos. And then verse 26. Then God said, let us make mankind in our image, in our likeness, so that they may rule over the fish in the sea and the birds in the sky, over the livestock and all the wild animals, and over all the creatures that move along the ground. Verse 27. So God, bara created mankind in his own image. In the image of God, he created them, male and female, he created them. So bara is this also this creative power that imprints identity onto humanity. So it's cosmos, it's the creation of all things, and it's also the, the, the creative energy three times that God created humanity in his image and in his likeness. And what's significant about this is that this kind of word becomes um, central to the Ten Commandments and the law in the Old Testament where people, uh, what God uses and what, what people begin to think about is how, um, how we aren't supposed to kill each other because we are created in the image of God. 
So the reason we're not supposed to murder for many reasons is that we, we hold, we are image bearers. And so the way that the Hebrews thought about this is if, if you want to destroy uh, or ruin an artist, destroy his art. And that's what's being described here in the beginning of our Bible. From the beginning, we see that God speaks the world into creation. And this, it's this raw, majestic kind of powerful creation that that creates the cosmos but it also imprints and lays the identity and the likeness and the image of God into humanity are you with me okay so bara bara is connected to the greek word that we see in ephesians but go to romans chapter 1 i want you to see it in another place before we talk about the nuance in ephesians just doing a quick bible study today <clears throat> romans chapter 1 we'll go verse 20 so Paul uses um, this, this word uh, as, as handiwork. The Hebrew uh, word is bara, but the Greek word is a different word. And let's, let's read verse 20 together, see if we can find the word. It says, verse 24, Since the creation of the world, God's invisible qualities, his eternal power and divine nature have been clearly seen, being understood from what has been made so that people are without excuse. So Paul explains that all of us are born with this intuitive sense that there is something bigger in the world. There's something out there that creation speaks and reveals God. And it says, the uh, the phrase is, uh, uh, has been made. And that's the word poema. Poema. Say poema. Greek. You got Hebrew and Greek today. Amazing. Great work. All right. So poema is this word. It's, 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 it's a word used for created. Um, it, it's a word that's used to describe, it's where we get the word poem or poetic. Um, it's a Greek word used to describe when God creates something. But it has this different nuance than raw, majestic power creation. It has this artistic, sculpting, um, detailed artist nuance. That God is crafting something. And so Paul, go back to Ephesians. Paul takes that word poema and he says in Ephesians chapter 2 verse 10, he begins to speak of the followers of Jesus, of redeemed humanity. He says, for we are God's poema. We are God's work of art. We, you, are a work of art. You are God's masterpiece being shaped in the image of God. Bara, God's majestic, raw creative power that speaks the world into existence and imprints identity into humanity. And it's only what God can create. Poema is the fine sculpting, the artistic creative expression of a delicate sculpture being fashioned into a masterpiece. Used for the world, describing what God did in the world, but now used as what God calls his redeemed humanity. Those that say yes to Jesus, is, uh, you see us as being followers of Jesus are being created created and sculpted into a work of art is that good news let's think about this for a second you were once dead but now you are alive in Christ being crafted and shaped and sculpted and perfected into a piece of art look to the person next to you and say you're a work of art now now say it again but mean it I want you to say to yourself, (laughs) I want you to say to yourself, I am a masterpiece. Say it out loud. I'm a masterpiece. I'm a work of art. That's right, you are. You are a work of art. This passage teaches us something about who we are in Jesus and something about who God is and what he is like. Apparently, according to this passage, God is in the recreating business. He's in the restoration business. He takes broken and flawed, sinful chunks of clay and transforms them to become like Jesus, perfected in his image. To be a follower is to be God's masterpiece and piece of art, work of art put on display. We are created by his power are alone for good deeds. This means that God has a purpose for your life and a purpose in creating you. 
Before God sat down with a lump of clay, he thought to himself, he had the mind of fashioning you for a purpose. If I have been recreated by God in Jesus, then I am no longer who I once was. And this is such good news for people like me who hated themselves, who looked in the mirror and saw ugly, disgusting, no value, no worth, not good enough, who literally tried to kill himself because he thought he had no purpose and life would be better dead than lived. And when that is dead and I'm a masterpiece, that is good news, is it not? What do you hear when you hear that you're a masterpiece and you're a work of art? I hear that before Jesus, you were fundamentally identified as a sinner, distant from God, dead in sin, without hope. But in Jesus, you are given a new self. You're a saint. The very nature of who you are, the fabric of your identity is no longer identified as a sinner or fallen short. God sees Jesus in you. Any Christianity that is based on how you don't measure up is not aligned with scriptures. God fine-tunes you and sculpts you into someone who is beautifully designed for good works. I just have to say it over and over again. You are a work of art. He sculpts you with precision to empower you to partner with him in the renewal of all things. You get to play and partner with God in creating God's redeemed new earth and new heaven. Pretty amazing, huh? So, with that understood, I want you to think about the implications of this letter 2,000 years ago. So let's put our our thinking caps on and go back into Ephesus. So this letter was written to a a group of churches, house churches, 10, 30, gathered um, all over the church in Ephesus. Paul was there for a few years planted other churches out of it. They saw a riot when the gospel came. They were filled with the Holy Spirit. We read about in Acts 19. But I want you to think about this letter being received to a group of people living in Ephesus a few thousand years ago. You with me? So Ephesus was the capital of Artemis worship. And Artemis worship um, was really the combination of two different deities found um, in Greece and uh, in the ancient Mesopotamia area. And uh, it was Kibbola, the god of fertility, and Diana, the god of the hunt and small animals. So those two gods became one, and when their powers combined, like Captain Planet, they became Artemis. (laughs) Earth, wind, fire, water. Was it the, I felt like the earth guy just didn't get, like, fire's awesome, water was cool, wind was cool, but it's like, earth, and it was just, <laughs> anyways, aging myself. Um, anyway, so Artemis, uh, this was the center of Artemis worship. Ephesus was a city of about 250,000 people, a massive port city. It was the second largest city outside of the Roman Empire. It was the place for the banking, uh, the banking capital of Asia and Asia Minor. Um, but Artemis was this, this deity that had favor all over the Roman Empire and ancient um, kind of Ephesus before that. It was one of the, the, her temple was one of the seven signs, uh, seven signs, one of the seven wonders of the ancient world. Massive temple. And a city of 250,000 people would flood with over a million people during their annual festival. And Artemis was worshipped through um, uh, people creating images of her, artifacts, uh, sculptures, and paintings paintings, and all sorts of things. And Ephesus was a city known for its beauty, a city known for uh, images and idols and, and these, these artifacts, these, these mosaics and statues dedicated to Ephesian citizens and mythology, but also all sorts of different gods. It was a massive industry. And so there's all sorts of art and beauty and people worshiping all sorts of gods. There were, there were literally, a, there were statues everywhere in the city. Um, archaeologists have found all sorts of artifacts um, dating back 2,000 years ago of, of individual homes uh, having their whole uh, side of their house painted and dedicated to a particular god or a mosaic dedicated to the particular gods. And so they worship gods and goddesses that they created. Um, these, art, these all sorts of um, uh, images in their, that they created, this beautiful artwork. And Ephesus was known for that. 
It was a place known for where gods were made into art and worshipped. Now, just picture that in your mind. You're walking around 2,000 years ago. Everywhere you go, there's a different statue with incense and flowers dedicated to the various gods. There's literally images of, of naked goddesses. And, and, and what you need to know about Greek culture and Hellenized culture is that they worship the perfect body. 2,000 years ago, they had this idea of perfection and anything that wasn't perfect was seen as cursed by the gods and it was discarded. And we have um, ancient letters. So in 1 BC, a man named Hilarion, check out this, this letter he wrote. So this is the end of a letter and I'll read it in just a second, but he's, he's away in Alexandria. In the letter, it talks about Alexandria. He writes to his wife who's in Ephesus, who's pregnant. And at the end of his letter, he says, Good luck to you. When you have a child, she was pregnant. If it is a boy, let it live. If it is a girl, throw it out. Here's what they thought in Ephesus, that to be, to be a woman was to be half a person. So if you had any type of deformity, anything that wasn't perfect, if you didn't look the right way when you were born, they literally discarded the babies into the wilderness in different places and let them die. Now, here's the other thing that you need to know. This is Ephesus. The other dominant industry was slave trade. Those babies were picked up by slave owners early on, raised as slaves and sold to the major industry all around the world because it was a port city in Ephesus. There was a whole generation of people being uh, living in Ephesus at this time. So Paul writes at the end of his letter to slave owners and to slaves, right? Ephesians chapter 6. He's writing to them about how to operate in the industry, um, in the workplace in some ways, uh, knowing that your identity is now in Jesus. But there's a whole generation of people, a whole group of people in Ephesus that have been discarded because they, haven't ha they don't have any value or worth because at some point early in their life, their parents abandoned them because they had some type of blemish or they were a female or they had some type of um, disability, left them for dead and they were picked up and raised up as slaves. And in this culture 2,000 years ago, it was all about who you knew, who you were, how much money you had, how beautiful you were, how your body had to be perfect, how smart you were, um, at what, how much stuff you collected over the years. Can we relate to that? 2,000 years ago. But then there's this letter, a very subversive letter. A guy named Paul writes to this Ephesian context. And would you put up that slide? In, in Ephesians, in Ephesus, people made gods in their image. And Paul says, no, our God makes people in his image. In Ephesus, people fashioned poema, statues of gods into our, our God fashions people into works of art. Do you have any idea how provocative this would have been for the guy sitting in the church who was a slave, discarded by his parents, seen as no value, and he's hearing that the creator of the universe created him with purpose and that he's a work of art. And it's not about how much you have. It's not about your identity found in what you do or what, you've been, what you look like. It's about what God says about you and you are his work of art. You think what humans can create is a masterpiece. Look at what God creates in you. Our God takes broken and flawed and discarded and abandoned people and calls them his son and daughter, calls them his beloved, calls him good enough, calls him saint and worthy, and most of all calls him a masterpiece. What would that do to your identity 2,000 years ago if you can relate to that type of society and culture? It's a little hard to bridge the gap. Would you agree? This is the point that Paul says the gods, um, you once thought that these temples and statues and sculptures and gods were images of true beauty, but you are better than that. The art that God is doing with you far surpa surpasses anything humans can do. He takes what is ugly, what is fallen, what is dead, and crafts it for beauty and perfection and good works. And this is the good news of who you really are. And if, I just need to ask, is there anyone here that's struggling to believe that that's true of them? That you sit in church and you hear this being spoken over you as truth, but you just don't believe it. Some of us are here and we think, actually, if I could just lose 10 pounds, then I would be beautiful enough. 
if I could just make that $10,000 more, then I would feel that sense of satisfaction and peace and I would know that I'm good enough that I've accomplished what's inside of me. If I could just buy that house and, and, and get that place or if I could just get that job, if I could just finish the education and get my degree, if I could just find that husband or that wife or if I could just look like that person, I just really wanna look, if I could just get rid of the lust in my heart and, and my quick temper, if I could just kick my addictions and maybe, maybe I would be a work of art. If I could just do that or maybe you're here and you're frustrated because you're thinking a work of art I can't have kids I'm damaged goods a work of art I've been dealing with this health crisis my entire life you're calling me a masterpiece I need help to get out of bed masterpiece I've been through divorce. I've been abused. I had an abortion when I was younger because my parents weren't there. I harmed myself. I tried to kill myself. I've looked at my body and I don't see enough. This is not who I am. But Jesus says, this is who you are. You are a masterpiece. Those things don't define you. Those things don't define who you get to be. And I know, and I know what it's like to, to think of the, those things, to think if I could just work this out, then, then I would be good enough. I remember when, uh, for those of you that have been in situations where you have no say over your physical body, over what you can produce, if you, you're struggling to have a child, I mean, that is a weight that so many of us carry, and it plays into our marriage, it plays into our conversations, it plays into every time we do a child dedication, and I know, I, pr- I feel it. I feel that pain. Jesus feels that pain. But you are a work of art. That doesn't define who you are. I remember when my wife was going through a a really tough, we've talked about this so much, but I remember when she was going through a heart condition and we were just struggling. And I remember she jokingly said this. She said, I'm just a lemon. And she would like, I'm sorry God gave you a lemon. And just that, that identity that we wear because we see other people healthy, we see other people successful, we see that we once had our health and now we're older and we don't have our, our, our bodies working properly. And the truth is that those things aren't who you really are. They don't get to define you, it's Jesus that gets to define you. And what he says about you is the truest thing about you, that you're his beloved, you're his son and daughter, you are a saint and you are a work of art. And if you're here and you're tired of your addictions, you're tired of finding your identity in broken relationships, you're tired of your uncontrollable anger, you're tired of your loveless marriage, if you're tired of hiding your real pain and your imperfections, well I have good news, you're in great company. Because the church is full of all of these people and I'm one of them. And if you're in good company, that means you're not alone in any of those things. So don't pretend to isolate. Second thing is that the truth that I'm trying to communicate is simply this, that that right in the middle of our lives, right in the middle of all that stuff, the pain, the brokenness, the imperfections, God begins to sculpt you to become the kind of person that is a work of art. And that Christianity is a story of of you you can't actually do anything to get there. You can't fix your marriage. You can't fix your addictions. You can't fix your false self. You can't fix your pain. You need a savior who is willing to save and rescue you. And poema is not what I or you do. It's what only God does. And the good news is, is, that, is this, that God is in the middle of your life, in the middle of your addictions, in the middle of your selfishness, your lust and anger, in your brokenness, and he transforms it. He's in the process of transforming that and making you a work of art. This is who you are. You are a work of art. And this is grace that God takes sinners, God takes screw-ups and failures and turns them into works of art. Amen? Amen. Amen. Can we pray together? Let's pray. I just invite you to close your eyes and just allow the silence for a moment just to speak to you.
as I was preparing this sermon, I was thinking of all the things that I think of myself that I have to challenge because of the truth of the scripture. And last week we wrote those false identities on our feet so that we can walk away stomping, knowing that soon the God of peace will crush Satan under our feet. This morning I think um, the, the sermon really leans us into a place of surrender, recognizing that it is by God's grace that all this happens. That he gives us his spirit to do the work of transformation. That we need to be in community. And when I say community, I mean intentional, authentic, worshiping community. Where we can be fully vulnerable, fully exposed, and yet fully ourselves. And we learn to become like Jesus. We need to take off our old patterns and put on new patterns. We need spiritual disciplines. But most importantly, we need his grace and his spirit to empower us for transformation. You know, I don't actually know how to lead us into this prayer time, so I'm just gonna allow some silence and then we'll worship. And if you are here and you just want prayer, we have an amazing prayer team that would love to pray and carry um, whatever it is you're feeling and sensing and uh, needing this morning. Maybe you're here and I said a specific kind of uh, word that that kind of has been your identity for a season. Maybe today this is a day where you come forward and just get prayer for that. Be honest and let God do the work. So Lord, would you come and minister to your people in your name, amen.